So good morning. So I'm a cyber psychologist. Cyber psychology is the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. My speciality area is forensic cyber psychology, which looks at criminal aspects of behavior online. So I like to say that technology was designed to be rewarding, engaging, and seductive for normal population. Did anybody really think about the impact on criminal, deviant, abnormal, and those who are vulnerable? So this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the elephant in the cyber room. When we talk about creating just societies, peaceful societies, when we talk about human rights, we are dependent on the will and the mood of general population in terms of what they feel about these issues. Now, I know causation, correlation, we can't without you know, longitudinal studies, but what we're seeing which I'm very concerned about, is we're seeing decreases in levels of empathy in young people over a 15-year period. We're seeing increases in levels of narcissism in young people coming through. And the effect is, is this related to technology? We only have to look at the current American election, <laughs> not getting political, but you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> to see the emergence of things that we thought were long gone and disappeared in terms of public debate. Hate speech, racism, misogyny, appearing in public forums. I wrote a piece for Time magazine, and if you get time, read it, because I said, the problem is when political leaders use cruelty as a strategy and appear to win elections because of it, those of us who dedicate our lives to trying to stamp out cyberbullying and trolling and criminal behavior online, that makes our job so much harder. Technology in itself is not good or bad. It is either used well or poorly by humans. So I'm going to say something nice about the internet because I'm always accused of being very negative. And the reason I point out the issues, the problems is, that we have an army of marketeers over here trying to sell us the latest shiny gadget, and they're telling us it's all good. So I'm pointing out the problems. Why? Because I want to introduce some balance into the debate, and then maybe we can meet in the center. As John said, I've just written a book called The Cyber Effect, and I start with, you know, I've been involved in a dozen different research silos, from sexting teens to cyber babies, from cyberchondria to organized cybercrime. And the one thing that I've observed is that whenever technology interfaces with a base human behavior, the result tends to be amplified and accelerated online. Now that's fantastic if you're talking about crowdsourced fundraising and altruism online, which is a positive trait. But if you're talking about cyberbullying or trolling or cyber criminal behavior, then that's problematic for society. I call this amplification the cyber effect. And we need to understand that effect in order to design into it. The point is, I firm, I'm pro-technology, absolutely pro-technology. I couldn't do my job as a cyber psychologist without being logged on <laughs> 12 hours a day. But the point is that the solutions to negative behaviors come from technology solutions. Let me give you an example in terms of criminality. Stalking in the real world, the motive to engage in stalking is the glimpse of, int of, of, of intimacy into the victim's life. The MO, the modus operandi, is to physically follow that person. It's a very labor-intensive transaction, one-on-one. -on -one. Now you come to cyber-stalking. Cyber-stalking, the motive is not a glimpse of intimacy, it is the victim's life, everything about them, their diary, their photographs, their thoughts, their hopes, their wishes, their desires, everything. The modus operandi is not following one person. A cyber stalker can stalk multiple victims simultaneously. Why? Because technology affords them the ability to do so. And we see the emergence of female cyber stalkers that we don't see in the real world. So if you've got a condition that is differentiated, a criminal condition, on three major points, the question is, are we still talking about the same thing? 
Or have we just been lazy and put the prefix cyber in front of it and presumed the behavior was the same? So as an academic advisor to Europol, one, one of my jobs as well as observer to Interpol to the specialist group, my job as a researcher, as a cyber behavioral scientist, is to explore these higher level architectures of behavior and to actually look forward. So this predictive analysis, you see the thing about human behavior, it doesn't stand still in time. There is the data that we know historically. As a behavioral profiler, my job is to take that intuitive and assumptive leap sort of like Colonel Mustard with the spanner in the kitchen, but not quite. <laughs> and the point is that because if we can't make these assumptive leaps, we're never going to be able to predict where the behavior is going next. In terms of what's happening in society, in terms of the negative behaviors, I put the responsibility back on the behavioral sciences, my own profession. They have been blindsided by rapid evolutions in technology. They are the people who are supposed to be advising general population in terms of how best to proceed with technology and actually to take and extrapolate the best from us. But they're sitting back going, you know, when I first came across artificial intelligence, it was in the late 90s, and I was fascinated. It was a chatbot called Jabberwacky. Have you ever talked to AI online? It's a lot of fun. Well, it is if you're a cyber psychologist. So, <laughs> so, but it's, it, it mimics human intelligence, and it'll pass the Turing test. And I thought, oh my goodness, this could be incredible for people suffering from social isolation. It could be incredible for kids maybe on the autism spectrum. And then I stopped, and I thought, well, maybe not. And I realized at that moment in time, there was nothing in my education to date as a psychologist that equipped me to understand the impact of technology on human behavior. So I went back to college to requalify to do a master's in cyber psychology and a full doctorate. And at this point in time, I'm probably the most qualified person in the world in this subject area. And I have made it my, my duty to go forth and to write and to talk and to try and deliver insight at that intersection between humans and technology. The internet could be something fantastic for us, for connectivity. It could be fantastic for peace. It could be fantastic for human rights. But we're not seeing that. We're seeing the emergence of horrible negative behaviors. As a woman online who speaks publicly about technology, you know, it's hard for people to listen to a an opinion from a woman about technology. To listen to an opinion from a woman about technology and politics is almost unbearable for some. So I get trolled all the time. And I write about this in my book and I'm saying, look guys, and I say guys, because, you know, <laughs> 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 let's make some assumptions. <laughs> you know, what I say is, when you troll me, I'm a behavioral scientist. All you're doing is giving me data and lots of it. <laughs> I mean, the point is we have to pay attention. Why are people so angry? Why are we seeing this venting online? What is behind it? And when we're talking about technology, again, come back to the profiling piece, we're not standing still in time. Babies are being born. Tablets are being thrust into their hands and mobile phones. Do you know that the American Academy for Pediatrics recommends no screen time for infants under the age of two? and nobody knows. Whose fault is that? That is the fault of the behavioral sciences that these, in, these messages are not getting out to general population. So if we're talking about tackling cyberbullying, there's no point in talking to kids when they're eight or nine. The behavior is already embedded. We should be having early learning netiquette classes for three and four year olds before they get near a tablet. Teaching them respect, teaching them principles of justice and peace before they engage in this environment. We should not be giving smartphones to six year olds. They are not psychologically, physiologically, sociologically, or developmentally able to cope with this environment. So where are the guidelines? Who is protecting children online? And if we talk to last night at dinner, Victor was talking about his experience and growing up in this violent environment. How have we arrived at a position in time where we are pipelining extreme violence to children? Legal but age-inappropriate content. 
adult pornography, extreme violence, self-harm, suicide sites available online? And we think this generation will grow up to make a difference? What do we know from research? We know the children who are traumatized. And Zaid and I, His Excellency, were talking earlier about you know, people who engage in torture have often been tortured as young people. We see content moderators who work in the Philippines come out of college and work for $8 an hour working as human filters for the social media companies, taking down this extreme content. We see early signs of post-traumatic stress disorder in that population. Is it, a, is it a stretch to think that children won't be damaged by this environment? Yet the space is so dominated by the freedom of the internet brigade that anybody, people like me who stand up and say, just a minute, how do we protect children? And please don't say parental controls. Please go and Google bypassing parental controls <laughs> and you will get a million results. And if you have children, you won't sleep tonight because the last couple of years, you haven't been protected. In an age of ubiquitous technology, it is almost impossible to protect children online. The US military, have an entity called Nippernet, an internet within the internet, to actually provi provide a safe environment for the military. And we can't do that for children. We can't do that to protect a population who are growing up. You look at cyberbullying. To paraphrase my favorite movie, the greatest trick the telecoms and social media companies have ever pulled is to convince us they can do nothing about cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is mathematics, it's content. Hate, die, offensive words. Direction, I'm bullying you, it's going from me to you. Factor in, interval and frequency equals escalation. It's mathematics. We could place an algorithm, a positive use of technology on a telecoms server. We're talking about minors, this is not surveillance, this is parenting. Artificial intelligence could monitor the transaction, the point at which the algorithm was triggered Digital outreach to the victim, to the child. Digital outreach to the parents. Parents should be the first person to know their child is being bullied and not the last. So we get confused about privacy and surveillance, but there's a way of looking at it that is, you know, more straightforward. If we think about in a just and secure society, and when I talk about real world society, we have to remember that what happens in a cyber context impacts on the real world. What happens in the real world impacts on cyber. There is a symbiotic relationship between these two things. Technology has the ability to have a pervasive and profound influence on human behavior. I'm very concerned about the type of society that we will have going forward if we're not careful and protective of how we're raising our children in this environment. So if we think about data protection and what the tech industry, two things I'm going to say. First of all, let's think of cyberspace as a continuum. Think about it as a line. On the far left, we have the keyboard warriors. We have the freedom of the internet brigade. We have premise of new frontier. We have hands off our space, no regulation, no, govern no governance. I debate against them all the time. And, and they have a motive to keep this space free because it's an idealism. On the far right, we have the tech sector. But they also have a motive. And guess what it's based on? Profit. It costs money. I'm not talking about regulation. We can never regulate at the speed at which we would need to do to actually, to, to actually keep up. But we can have some level of governance. We can have good practice. And we could certainly, to reflect Victor's comments, we can have cyber ethics. We can have an ethical approach to this space. There are three aims. The aim to achieve privacy in an age of technology, the aim of collective security, and the aim of the vitality of the technology sector. None of those aims should have primacy over the other. Privacy cannot trump collective security if we want to live in secure societies. And the tech industry cannot dominate both. So if we think about this continuum, 
keyboard warriors on the left and tech industry on the right. The rest of us, the 99.9% .9 of us and our children, we get to live in the middle. But at the moment, we have no say in this space. So I'm appealing here, the Hague Talks, to reclaim this space, to be concerned about those who are vulnerable online, to be concerned about children and protecting them because they are the future of society. And if they are negatively impacted by what they see, to the young people in the audience here, I would say, in terms of looking at extreme content online, there is no command delete file for the brain. What is seen cannot be unseen. Do not expose yourself to this content. You will desensitize yourself. And how will you be a good global citizen if you lose empathy? In terms of children, while the UN High Commissioner is here, His Excellency, I would directly appeal to you that the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child was enshrined in 1989. There's no mention of digital or internet or technology, clearly, at that point in time. But enshrines the right of a child to have a healthy mental and physical development. And I would argue, as long as children are exposed to extreme content online, legal but age inappropriate, then effectively we are depriving them of a right to a childhood, a right to innocence, a right to a healthy development. So I would petition here and now in these talks that we consider an amendment to the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child to enshrine and to incorporate their rights in a cyber context. And beyond that, a greater plea for society that the reason we see cyber feral behavior online is because there's a perception that nobody's in charge. There is no order. And that's because the reality is that nobody's in charge. So just to finish up with a thought from Thomas More from, from the play A Man for All Seasons. Thomas More likened the law to a forest. The forest is there for our collective protection. The point at which we cut down the trees selectively in cyberspace, we collectively have no protection. Thank you.